Okay. Are we live? Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to um, Ephesus Ministries. And this is our Wednesday night Bible study. Um, we are going to open with a few minutes of prayer. But before we go to the throne of glory, are there any prayer requests or praise reports on this evening? My prayer tonight, I can't, I'm sorry, there was two people speaking at the same time. Go ahead, Mother Marsh. Thank you, God, again, much. for all of us being on his wake-up list. Amen. Thank the Lord for asking for prayer. Um, for Christopher, who was who had developed another problem, was in the hospital. And I'm thankful to say he's home. They found out what they think it is. So thank you all for your prayers in Christopher's home. Amen. Amen. We pray for my granddaughter, Hassana. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Prayer request. Go ahead, Mother. Praising God for being so good. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will Indeed. Be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Indeed. Any... Go ahead. Um, I just thank God for another good day in him. And I'm asking for prayer for me and my family. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Again, I just want to thank and praise God for um, the miracle that he worked on for our family this week and bringing Brandon home. He was missing for three hours. And the Lord worked it out in such a miraculous way. And now he's reunited with his father. And we just want to cover him in prayer, continue to pray for him and pray for his mind and all of those children that struggle with behavior issues and uh, emotional issues. God, we ask right now in the name of Jesus that you cover them, that you touch their minds, God, in the name of Jesus, that you bring clarity of thought. Hallelujah. We thank you, God, for who you are how you, you attend to each and every one of our prayers and petitions, Lord. Nothing is too small for you, Lord, nothing. And so as we come to the throne of glory tonight, we come with the spirit of thanksgiving. We come with a spirit of gratitude, Lord. Hallelujah, you did it again, Lord. Hallelujah, we thank you. We ask right now for those petitions that are on the throne. God, continue to heal Christopher Marsh's body, Lord. Continue to touch him, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Let him know, hallelujah, that he's not alone in this thing, God, that you are still God on the throne of glory. We thank you. We praise you in advance for everything that you're going to do in his body. We praise you in advance. Touch Hassana, Lord. God, you know what's going on in her mind, God, in her spirit, God, in her family, God. We ask that you continue to cover her, God, and attend to the prayers of a loving and concerned grandmother. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Continue to cover her, God, and protect her. Hallelujah. Give her success and victory in school, God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We continue to pray for Mother Ruiz and her family, God. God, you know what's needed in that family. Continue to bring them together, Lord, to heal every broken place, God, in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, not just physical healing, God, but mental and emotional and spiritual healing, God, was needed, God, to make them whole again in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord for just allowing us to come together one more time, hallelujah, to praise you and glorify you and give you honor, God. You alone are worthy, hallelujah. I thank God, I thank you for how you kept us all week long, God. You kept back the hand of death one more time, God. Glory to your name. Who wouldn't serve a God like this? Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. We pray again, Lord. 
hallelujah, for children everywhere, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Such a violent time we live in, God. Cover them, God, in the name of Jesus. Cover them with the blood, God, in the name of Jesus. Give them a chance, God, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. Your word says, suffer the little children to come unto you, God. Hallelujah, Lord, to give us the wisdom, God, hallelujah, to lead them to the throne of glory, to lead them into salvation. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, God. Lord, we continue to pray. Hallelujah for those that are mourning. Hallelujah, Lord. Those that are brokenhearted. Hallelujah, Lord. Send your spirit, God, a spirit of comfort, God. Hallelujah, Lord. They need to know that, hallelujah, in the midst of their sorrow, God, there is still God, hallelujah, who still cares for them, God. We thank you on tonight, God. You are a wonder-working God. Hallelujah. We love you on tonight, God. We praise you on tonight, God. Hallelujah. We lift your name on tonight, God. Hallelujah, Lord. God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for these 40 days of consecration, God. We thank you for what you have revealed to us, Lord. Hey, glory. Hallelujah, Lord. God, you are worthy so much more, worthy of so much more, God. Every sacrifice, God, hallelujah, Lord, and let it be a sweet-smelling Savior to you, Lord, uh, hallelujah. Every offering made, hallelujah, receive it, God, uh, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. We love you on tonight, God. Uh, we praise you on tonight. We lift you on tonight, God. Continue, Lord, uh, to cover our leaders, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Not just our leaders, Lord, but pastors and preachers and bishops and apostles and those that walk in ministry, God. Hallelujah, Lord. A fresh anointing, Lord. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. More power from on high, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. These are the last and evil days that we live in, God. We need power, God. We need your power, God. We need your power, God. Hallelujah. To reach the lost, God, in the name of Jesus. But most of all, God, we need the power to love, the power to love in adverse situations, the power to love through hatred. Uh, hallelujah. The power to love through indifference, God. The power to love through intolerance, Lord. The power to love through racism, God. We need your agape love to overtake us, Lord, so that we have the power to continue to love in spite of God. Hallelujah, Lord. Help us to recognize who the true adversary is, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Help us to stay equipped for spiritual warfare, God. In the name of Jesus the Christ. Hallelujah, Lord. God, we just thank you and we praise you. We honor you, Lord. Continue, Lord, to, to help and help. Hallelujah, Lord. Those, hallelujah, that need help, God. Continue to give hope to those, God, who need help. Hope, God, in the name of Jesus, uh, use us, God. Use us as thou would see fit, Lord, that we may bring glory to the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Uh, help us to crucify this flesh every day, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Uh, so that we might walk up right before you, Lord. Uh, hallelujah, Lord. So we may represent the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. In the name of of Jesus. We continue to pray for our mothers, God, the mothers of Zion, the fathers of Zion everywhere, those that have labored, God, for years and years and years, God, how you keep them strong, God, how you you, you touch their bodies, God. Hallelujah. How you continue to put wisdom in their mouths, God, in the name of Jesus. We lift them up to you, Lord. Hallelujah. Every mother name by name, God, one by one, God, bless them, God, and Keep them, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Let your sovereign will always be done, God. Always, Lord. Always. We pray for the people of God everywhere. Hallelujah, Lord. In the last days, God, bring them in, Lord. You said if you be lifted up, hallelujah, you would draw them. So help us lift your name higher, God. Help us lift your name so they will be drawn into the ark of safety, Lord, before it's too late. We pray for our family members, those that are not saved, those that are struggling to Hallelujah, Lord, to find salvation, God. We pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you, hallelujah, will save them, God, before it is too late. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Glory to your name, God. 
Glory to your name, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you for your mercies today, God. New mercies this morning, God. Thank you. Hallelujah. You didn't have to do it, Lord, but you did. I thank you, Lord. Uh, I praise you, hallelujah, on this evening, God. Hallelujah. There's none greater than you, Jesus. There's none greater in heaven and earth. Hallelujah, Lord. And so we glorify you, Lord. And we worship and praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. We honor you on tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Thank God and amen. If there's anybody who came on, um, just coming on, and if you have a prayer request or praise report, please um, acknowledge now. Yes, I have a praise report. Amen. And, and my family knows, and I'm yes. not going to go into detail, but God performed a miracle to me, and nothing is too small. He showed me that nothing is too small. Yes, yes, no yes. No one is too far away from him that he does not hear my prayer, hear your prayers, or yes, that, just, a, just a simple little touch. And I just Hallelujah. Thank God. On tonight, I give him all the glory and the praise and the honor, and he has increased my faith in Jesus. Amen. Name. Amen. We thank God for that testimony. I know that the entire testimony, and I know that we serve a mighty God. Yes, indeed, we do. We serve a mighty God. And as Pastor Gretchen was saying, nothing is too small for God. Nothing is too small for him to care about and attend to. All he's waiting for us to do is to cry out to him. Cry out from the depths of our souls sometimes. Cry out from the depths of our hearts sometimes. And he will answer you. Thank and praise God again. This is our Wednesday night Bible study. Um, the title of this Bible study is Great is Thy Faithfulness, coming from Genesis chapters 44 through 47. And much of um, this Bible study, well, at least in the beginning, will be kind of a review from what Pastor Gretchen um, taught on last um, Wednesday um, until we get um, to chapters 46 and 47. But I entitled it Great is Thy Faithfulness, because it is talking about how the plan of God from beginning to end will always be executed according to his divine will. And oftentimes as people of God and those who are trusting God, we don't understand what God is doing um, sometimes because we can't see the whole picture. And sometimes we find ourselves because of something we've done or simply because of life, we find ourselves in dire straits sometimes. And waiting for something that God has promised us. And sometimes when you're waiting a long time for something from God, it seems like everything, everything opposite what God has promised you is going on in your life. But I want you to understand tonight that great is his faithfulness. And it is in the darkest hours, great is his faithfulness. On the mountaintop, hallelujah, great is his faithfulness. And so we're going to just do a recap of um, the lessons from last week. Joseph and his brothers. He was the 11th son of Jacob, but the first son through Rachel, his favorite wife. Um, Rachel, um, the favorite wife. And Jacob loved Joseph more than the other sons because he was born when Jacob was old. Of course, Jacob made no attempt to hide his favoritism towards Joseph. And this caused his brothers to hate him. Favoritism is a natural propensity. We have favorite foods. We have favorite colors. We have favorite movies, favorite singers, songs, etc. But there are situations or scenarios where favoritism can be extremely damaging. And that often happens when a parent shows more regard or love or favoritism towards one sibling than another. And this is what has happened in this family. There were many brothers, but jo Joseph was the favorite one. He was the favorite beloved son of an old man. And to make matters worse, when he was a teenager, he had dreams in which the family would bow down to him. And because he was a teenager, 
of course he would go and brag to his brothers about his dream. And that only infuriated them even the more. You can imagine that this is this kid is the favorite that he gets anything he wants from his father. His father dotes on him and lifts him high above the other brothers. And then he comes along and says, hey, let me tell you about these dreams. And in these dreams, you guys are bowing down to me. And his brothers hated him so much that they sold him into slavery. But they told Jacob that he had been killed by wild animals. Favoritism is a natural but sometimes destructive trait. There are some areas where favoritism in interpersonal relationships is utterly destructive, especially in parenting. A short look at the biblical stories of Isaac and Jacob and their families shows how damaging parental favoritism can be. And we have, and every child, especially if you have multiple uh, children, each child is always gifted with separate personalities. And I think the challenge for parents always is to love them all equally, but love them according to their separate personalities. Something that Jacob did not do. A dream manifested. The working of God's plan is truly remarkable. Then through a series of events, the story continues on, that saw Joseph become the supervisor of an Egyptian official's household, then falsely accused of rape by the same official's wife, thrown into prison, elevated to Pharaoh's second in command because of his God-given ability to interpret Pharaoh's dreams and devise a plan for Egypt to survive and even prosper through a coming seven-year drought. His brothers find themselves bowing down before him and asking to buy food because the drought had caused the famine to spread beyond Egypt, even into Canaan. And Jacob remembered the dreams Joseph had as a boy when he saw them bow down to him. These things have happened between Joseph and his brothers from the time they first appeared in his presence in Egypt, right up to where we are in chapter 44. They have been to bring, and this is the whole reason everything that happened to Joseph happened, to bring God's plan for his family to fruition. Joseph misled his brothers not to be spiteful, not to be vengeful, but because God was using him to bring them to a place of correction and restoration. Remember, we serve a God of restoration and healing. It is always his desire to bring us to a place of healing and restoration. The brothers, first the brothers had to face what they had done to Joseph and their fathers. And they don't recognize who Joseph is. And this is where the story gets interesting. Joseph lets his brothers continue to think that he's an Egyptian and he accuses them of being spies. Recapping. Chapter 44, so this takes us into chapter 44. Joseph instructs that his own silver cup be placed in the sack of Benjamin. Now, Benjamin is the second son of Jacob and Rachel, and he was also loved by Jacob. So Je Joseph's silver cup was a symbol of his authority. This is why they he asked that the silver cup be placed in Benjamin's bag because the silver cup was a symbol of his authority. So it was a great offense that it was taken or thought to be taken. It was thought to have supernatural powers and to steal it was a serious crime. Such goblets were used for predicting the future. Of course, Joseph wouldn't have needed his cup since God told him everything he needed to know about the future. After the brothers leave, Joseph sends his steward after them to accuse them of theft. The brothers protect, protest their innocence and say that if this has happened, let the guilty one die and the rest be slaves. Upon seeing the cup found in Benjamin's sack, the brothers are so distraught, they tear their clothes. When they return, they fall on the ground in front of Joseph. And tearing clothes was an expression of deep sorrow, a customary manner of showing grief. The brothers were terrified that Benjamin would be 
harm. And so they rent their clothes and fell down on their faces before Joseph. Judah, the brother who had suggested years ago that Joseph be sold in as sold, sold as a slave, passionately pleads for Benjamin for their father's sake and offers himself as a slave if Joseph will only let Benjamin return to their father. And that's Genesis 44, verses 18 through 34. This is the brother who sets sell him into slavery. But even, even at that point, because the other brothers wanted to kill Joseph. So even when they sold Joseph into slavery, it was Judah's compassion that was an operation even back then. He did not want to see his brother killed. And so here we have Judah at the forefront again, passionately pleading for Benjamin, for his father's sake. So there has been some changes over the years in this brother and in the other brothers. Question, why did Joseph set a trap for his brothers? This is a review, so I know everybody can answer it. Anybody? Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay, don't scare me like that. Can anybody Thank answer you, the sir. question? Why did Joseph set a trap for his brothers? To make them guilty so he could get Benjamin. I think so they would have to bring Benjamin back. Mm, okay. No, is that wrong? No, that's part okay. of the answer. Um, it wasn't because he wanted to see if they had any kind of remorse at all for what they did to him? Yes. Yes, they did. Yes. He wanted to see if his brothers had changed. All right, so instead of killing the youngest brother, though Joseph never actually seemed to have any intention of killing any of his brothers, especially not Benjamin, he suggests that they stay behind as a servant, likely knowing that this would not go over well with his father when his brothers returned to him. Judah pleads that he be the one to stay instead, for he has taken the responsibility of the safe return of Benjamin. Remember, he promised his father, because his father didn't want to let him go, so he promised his father that he would take special care of Benjamin, because Benjamin was special to the father. That's in Genesis 43, verses 8 through 10. Judah tells Joseph the whole story of what happened with their father and Benjamin when they returned to their land. Because of the depth of the feeling and sincerity of purpose, this speech, the speech that Judah made was unexcelled. It was said to be the most moving address in all the word of God. And so he was passionately from his heart, from the depths of his soul, pleading with Joseph to have mercy, the same mercy that the brothers would not extend to him 20 some years before. Benjamin was all that Jacob, their father, had left of the sons of Rachel. And if they did not return with Benjamin, it would kill Jacob. And we will see in the next chapter that when Judah talks about his father is when Joseph can't hold back his emotion any longer to keep up the facade. Okay, here's a question. The brothers knew that Benjamin was loved and favored by their father. So why didn't they do to him what they did to Joseph? That's an open-ended question. So what do you think? So why didn't because why, they, why felt did they, they had do? they felt they had done enough? They were they were actually probably feeling sorry. Can you say that again, um, Elder Shaw? They felt that they had done enough with Joseph as it was to do that again to their father they just felt bad about it so you think that there was some some genuine remorse going on there to a certain point before their father 
Okay, so the it was more the compassion was more towards the, what would happen to the father if they did that to Benjamin. Yes. And, and so were, I think Joseph made them jealous with bragging about whatever, and Benjamin didn't do that. I was Benjamin thinking the same thing. Their face wasn't always in their face bragging on stuff, you know. Mm. So I think the only reason they did that to Joseph because he was always bragging and in their face, but Benjamin wasn't doing that. Oh, okay. okay. I think that uh, maybe um, they knew that would kill their father. Mm hmm. Yeah, that 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 as well. But they had no really had no reason, you know. If I think if Joseph hadn't been the, telling them all that he told them, they would not have bothered killing him. You know, so do you think that? Jealous. So do you think that? Um, because obviously there was favoritism, great favoritism going on with this brother also. Um, so do you think that that had any? That, that had an effect on the way they treated Benjamin because it appears that they love Benjamin. I still yeah. stick to what I I'm, said that they would they would probably cause their father to die or go through a lot of suffering if the same thing happened to him, Benjamin. Yeah, that mm -hmm. as well. The additional is both things. It's both things. I feel mm -hmm. you know, yeah, that also, that's also. Amen. Oh. Thank you. I, I, listen, I love for you all to think about um, the lesson and what's going on in the lesson. All right. Let's go on to the next slide. This is chapter 45. Joseph reveals his identity, God's plan, and Joseph's forgiveness. It's a powerful. Yes. If I could just jump up real quick because I didn't think about it until you just said the next slide. We're enjoying listening to you, but your screen is not shared if you wanted it to be. You can't see my screen? I can't. I only see you. No, can't see it. Oh no my screen. God. No oh. screen at all. Oh, come on. Can you all give me a minute then? But I'm enjoying The lesson still is still great. Oh, I can't get I this thing wanted, right. I <laughs> I can't get it right. It's either screen, no face, no face screen. Okay, I'm just going to continue on, all right? Is that okay? Yes, yes. ma'am. This is so wonderful. Okay, so, all right. Forgive me, y'all. Please forgive me. Facebook, forgive me. Okay, so chapter 45 it says, when Joseph saw his brothers were willing to offer themselves into slavery in exchange for Benjamin's freedom, Joseph was overcome by emotion and revealed himself to his brothers. To Joseph's joy, he was also able to be reunited with his father, Israel, or Jacob. The brothers have passed their test. They have passed their test. Um, the reality of their repentance over the evil that they did, jo uh, did, Joseph, is demonstrated by their conduct on behalf of Benjamin. So Joseph was watching and listening to their plea for a brother, the plea that they didn't have for him those many years prior. So Joseph knew that there had to be a change in them. The desperate plea broke Joseph's heart. He made all the Egyptians who were in the room with him and his brothers leave because he was overcome with emotion. It overtook it, it overtook his heart. And once they were gone, Joseph revealed his identity to his brothers. At first, they were terrified by the realization, but then he told them not to worry or to blame themselves because it was all a part of God's plan. Isn't that marvelous? I think that is so awesome about God. When we think that things are going their worst, that God is still in control. And that's what we say as saints all the time. That's one of our favorite things to always say, God is in control, God is in control. And yet we don't live like God is in control because God used Joseph. So everything that happened to Joseph had to happen to bring him to this particular place in time. It was more, it was not just about uh, the redemption of his brothers. It was not just about that, but it was also for Joseph's sake, because something supernatural took place in his heart. 
Can you imagine that you have to forgive? These are your brothers and you have to forgive them. They threw him in a hole, sold him into slavery, wanted to kill him. These are This is much later in his life. And then here they are standing in front of him. He had the power and the authority to have them all executed. But something supernatural took place in his heart. Because God used him to save the lives of people who would have starved, who were starving from famine. That's famine. That was the greater, the bigger picture. But every part of that picture, every piece of that puzzle was part of God's plan. And God was doing something for everybody in every place in that scenario. He would, there was something for the brothers. Amen. There was something for Joseph himself. There was something for a father. And then there was something for all those who have been suffering in the family. That's how wonderful God is. I'm so glad that I can't see the whole picture. It stretches our faith. It does. It causes us to say, God, I trust you no matter what. I might be suffering right now. I might be in pain. I don't understand my loss. But God, I, I still trust you. I will still trust you. Joseph continued on to tell them what God has purposed for him, setting him up in a position to save many people. Look at that. From a ditch to a person in place to save many, including his own brothers, his own family, and how it was God's will that he get to get to this place. They met him. They meant harm to him, but God had taken away what they had meant for evil. Listen to that and use it to save his people. So what the devil means for evil doesn't mean anything in God's plan because God will turn it around and make it for his good. And there are two aspects to the story that are absolutely remarkable. The working of the plan of God and then the kind of forgiveness that Joseph has for his brothers. The level of of Joseph's forgiveness that he shows to his brothers is phenomenal. Phenomenal. Question, why do you think the brothers were, un were unable to recognize Joseph? I know we talked briefly about this last week. How come they didn't recognize him? This is their brother. Anybody? You should remember from last week. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anybody remember from it, last week? It was, I believe, over 20 years since they had seen him. And he was just a teenage boy mm -hmm. the last time they saw him. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they wouldn't recognize him. Uh, can I add to that, too? Yes, you may. Because <laughs> we, we're talking about somebody who aged from 17 to nearly 40. So, absolutely right, Mother Ruiz. So, but Joseph was in the land of Egypt. He looked like an Egyptian. He dressed like an Egyptian. He was manicured like an Egyptian. He smelled like an Egyptian. He talked like an Egyptian. He had the etiquette and the education of an Egyptian. He combed his hair like the Egyptians, but he was still different. There was something different about Joseph. What was different about him? In all of that, why was he still different? He was a Hebrew. He was a Hebrew. And what did that mean? Yeah. Okay. Let somebody else answer. <laughs> he was a Hebrew, but what does that mean? That means that he was, even though he was all of those things as an Egyptian, he was still a Hebrew in his heart and in his mind. Then that means that he served God. Amen. There you go. <laughs> All right. All right. God, through the faith of Joseph, preserved the family line of Abraham. Yes, he did. The family line that leads directly to Jesus Christ. That's Genesis 44, 1 through through one through 47 to 31. That's a key point. Here is which here is the power of God, the supernatural power of forgiveness. We we talk a lot about forgiveness. We got to remember 
that it was because of his brothers that Joseph had gone through all the hardships in his life. It was them who sold him into slavery. Um, and that action led him to being sold in Pot to Potiphar's house that led to false accusations that landed him in jail for multiple years, multiple years. But here's the thing. You have to make a decision to forgive. It, you have to. Joseph would have had a lot to be angry about with his brothers, but he almost just drops it like it was nothing. Throughout the whole chapter, Joseph attributes everything to God, saying that it was him who got him there in order that his people might be saved. It will be very difficult to develop the spirit, uh, uh, develop the forgiving spirit that Joseph portrays here, but it is precisely this spirit of forgiveness for which we should strive. We are to strive for. Here's the key point. When you forgive, you must decide to do so. You have to make a decision that you want to forgive. And when you decide to release that thing, because you have to release it, the thing that holds you captive in your mind, that holds you captive in your heart, because unforgiveness is bondage. Because every time you think about that thing, every time you see that person, every time you, you, you get angry all over again, you become hurt all over again, you experience it all over again. And I remember many times saying, God, I want to forgive, but I don't know how to let it go. And once you say that to God, I'm sincerely, from your heart, say, God, I want to forgive. Because sometimes we don't. Sometimes we want to hold on to it until we're ready to go to God and ask for some help. Sometimes we just want to, oh, we want to be mad. We want to be hurt. We want to be offended. Yes, we do. For a little while so that we ha can justify our anger towards somebody. Because you did that thing to me, I'm justified in the way I direct my anger towards you. And that is not how God, I don't care how human we are. I walk in my flesh every day. God said, but there is greater. My power is greater than that. And so the place of real forgiveness is not in your mouth because we say it all the time. It's in your heart. That's the place of real forgiveness. It's in your heart. And it does not matter. I, I hate this. If you forgive, you don't, you, you forget. No, you don't. It does not matter if you forget the offense. It does not matter if you remember the offense. What matters is that you forgive the offense. That's all that matters. Forgiveness has everything to do with allowing God to change the condition of your heart. I'm a witness. He'll do it. And I'm sure that many of the saints online tonight can witness, attest to the fact that when you say to God, I can't do this without you. I want to be mad. I want to be hurt. I want to wallow in the abuse. I want to live here. I want to park here. But I really need you to help me, God, so I can get on with my life. Do you know that unforgiveness will lock down your life? It will render you immobile to advance in any direction. You park there, you live there, and it keeps you in bondage, unforgiveness. That's why God has talked so much in his word about forgiving. If you don't, I won't. If you can't, I will give you the ability to do it. Forgiveness. And we get, sometimes we get so bent out of shape over the silliest things. Somebody didn't say hi to me. Somebody didn't speak to me. Somebody didn't acknowledge me. And then there it is, that rock of offense. And let me tell you something about those little bitty rocks of offense. They hide in your heart and they become boulders of bitterness. And then you can't look at a person without an attitude. You can't do it. 
I saw, this is many, many, many years ago. I, already, I tell it sometimes just as a reminder to myself of how foolish unforgiveness can be. Saw somebody in the grocery store. I could not stand this person. Boy, Elder Dooley, you get, yeah. yeah. Flesh, just like you, need, needed deliverance. And so I made sure that I, my, my cart had no contact with her cart at all in the grocery store. So when I saw her across the aisle, I went in the opposite direction. Crazy. Kept going, kept going. In my mind, and in my mind saying, I'm not talking to this heifer. Not talking to her. Don't want to see her. I can't even remember why I was offended by her. But the foolishness of unforgiveness sometimes. But there is a God. Mm, thank you, Jesus. There is the power of the Holy Ghost. That you would, if you would allow him to liberate your heart. And then you look back on the offense and say, wow, wow God. And there are things that I know are people have been damaged beyond belief. The abuse and the violence that perpetrated from human being to human being. But God said, I got a healing for that too. The healing is wrapped up in forgiveness. It sets the captive free. It does. As servants of the Lord, we are called to a spirit of forgiveness, just as he has forgiven us all of our sins. No matter how grotesque, and I read the news sometimes, and it's incomparable, the the things that human beings are doing to each other. It, it would take God Almighty to help people to navigate to the spirit of forgiveness for the things that have been done to them. It takes a God because in humanness, you would never be able to do it. Never. But the power of forgiveness is so great. It's so awesome. It is. If you would allow it. See here, there, there it is. There's the rub. If we would allow it. If we would allow God to do it in our hearts. Sometimes it requires swallowing your pride. Boy, tell you. Tell you. Well, I, I was thought I had forgiven someone. This is just not so long ago. Thought I had forgiven this person. And the Lord said, uh -uh, not yet. He said, when you are able to pray to me earnestly, for real, for this person, then you will be set free. For real. It's got to be real. And I know it's a supernatural transformation because when you say to God, I want to forgive, but in my humanness, because we're all human, I don't know how to let it go. I can't let go of the hurt. I don't know how to let go of the pain. I don't know how to let go of the betrayal. I don't know how to let go of the humiliation, the condemnation the ridicule, the betrayal, the degradation. I don't know how to let that stuff go. Unless I give this to you, Lord, it won't be done. And so what Joseph did was phenomenal. And forgiveness, real, real spiritual Holy Ghost fuel. Forgiveness is phenomenal. It, it really is. And once, once you are released from it, I mean, when you are really released from it, it's almost like, what was all of that for? Why did I lock myself down for so long for this thing that God said, I can deliver you in an instant? And I remember being set free from unforgiveness one Friday night in Ephesus, and the Spirit of God had came in that place. It was a Friday night. 
And I was standing over by a pillar and the Holy Ghost washed over my heart and said, you are free. And I was. I was. Because I was in a place of worship, but I had already gone to God and said, God, I can't do it. I, I can't do it. But I want to do it. I want to forgive. And so the brothers are reunited with Joseph. And Joseph is reunited with his little brother and his father. And now God is moving on with the plan. Excuse me, Elder Dooley, before you yes. continue on. Okay, we talk about us forgiving somebody. What if someone does not forgive you and it bothers you that they are not forgiving you? Let it go because that's not your problem. If they can't, okay. that's between them and God. You can't make somebody forgive you. The only thing that you have control over is your own heart and surrendering it to God. But what you can do, Mother Marsh, is go to God in prayer for them. They still must make the decision. And then you have to still act um, it, accordingly. You have to still be a saint in front of them. Sometimes we have to be loving and kind or even sometimes just cordial in the face of pure hatred. But that's God's business. I'm learning, Mother Marsh. I stopped playing little God. That's God's business. And as much as you may want it, that person to forgive, that's God's that that's God's business. But you make sure that your heart stays right before God. And okay. then I'm so, I can't hear you. I'm, I'm so sorry because your lesson is so good, but I didn't want to wait. Can I just add to what you just answered to Mother Marsh? Yes. I think in addition, El Julie is exactly right, but I think in addition, sometimes the problem is we're saying that person didn't forgive me, and we tend to project our stuff onto, onto others, and sometimes it's not a matter of whether that other person forgave you or not. It's mm -hmm. you forgiving yourself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely not even the responsibility of them right. forgiving you. Sometimes it's harder for us to forgive ourselves than it is other people. And, and that so is so it's true. Not the problem that they didn't forgive you. It's really have you forgiven yourself yeah. because mm -hmm. you can't even be free to receive their forgiveness until you receive, until you forgive yourself. Amen. And that is so true. We 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 are our hardest critics. We beat ourselves up more than anybody else could ever beat us up sometimes. That's thank you, um, Pastor Shannon. Thank you. So it's okay. supernatural, but it, we have to real it's supernatural. It is it's a supernatural transformation of the, of your heart. Um so when you really think about God's forgiveness, forgiveness again, it is truly phenomenal. And so now we at another part again of the plan. And so the tribe moves to Egypt. Slaves in the land of Egypt. In the book of Exodus, a major theme is the bondage of the children of Israel in the land of Egypt and their exodus from the situation via the power of God. It all starts with Joseph. And then this story about Joseph's family's relocation to the city of Goshen in the land of Egypt. After Joseph's revelation to his brothers, he sent them back to Canaan to get their father and the entire family to bring them to Egypt so that he could take care of them because the famine was not yet over. And when Jacob heard that Joseph, his most beloved son, was still alive, he was overjoyed and he said, now I can die a happy man. So he decided to go with them to see Joseph. So 70 people in all come with Jacob out of the land he was dwelling in and into the land of Goshen that had been provided for Joseph's family. As Joseph prepares to bring some of his brethren before Pharaoh, he tells them to Pharaoh, he tells them to Pharaoh that they were shepherds so that they might be given the land of Goshen, the northern part of Egypt to dwell in, which is indeed what they end up doing. And th this was a very rich land. So because they were shepherds, they got land in order that they may feed their flock. So God knew what he was doing. So 
And then I, the question is, then why bondage, Lord? Why bondage? Genesis 15, 12 through 21 says this. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, a horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, no certainty that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not there and will serve them and they will afflict them for 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. And 15, verse 15, chapter 15, verse 16 says, but in the fourth generation, they shall return here. For the iniquities of the Amorites is not yet complete. So here it is. The nation that they were to dispossess for God to fulfill his promises um, to them was still, still wasn't wicked enough to be destroyed, but they would be in another 400 years. The Israelites couldn't enter the promised land until they had been in bondage. 400 years, just long enough for their former tenants to be ready to be destroyed for their wickedness. Everything is a part of God's plan. Exodus 1, 8 through 10 says, Then a new king who did not know Joseph came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, these Israelites have become too numerous and too powerful for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase even the more. And if a war breaks out, they may join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. And so as time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, our people, people in Egypt increased greatly in number. Here's the thing about what happened to them in the 400 years. Everything is about God's plan. See, the Israelites were a people without a home. They, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were wanderers relying on the hospitality of others to graze their animals, which was their livelihood. They were a small band, but before they could take over whole countries, remember, they are going to be a great nation. Before they could take over whole countries, they needed to become a nation themselves. Look at God. So even in the bondage, God said, I'm going to prosper and grow you. And you are going to be caught in this bondage. You're going to be great before they could take over country. Where could they go to accomplish this? The answer the Lord gave Abraham and his descendants was Egypt. So it had been predestined that they would go to Egypt. And for 400 years, they would labor in Egypt. But despite all of the difficulties in bondage to another country, the blessings outweigh the trial. In those 400 years, the family of Israel grew from a tiny band of 70 people to a nation of millions. Exodus 1, 5 and 6, the descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all, including Joseph, who was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were fruitful and increased rapidly. They multiplied and became exceedingly numerous so that the land was filled with them. They were like almost like ants. The land was filled with them. And the Egyptians tried to stop their growth, but they couldn't because God was on their side. This was part of God's plan. The Lord continued to prosper them by making them more fruitful than their host nation, despite all of Pharaoh's efforts to the contrary. So these are the blessings. By being in bondage, the Israelites were held in one place so that they could become a nation. So God parked them right there. And this is where he said they were going to become a great nation. They were no longer forced to wander as nomads as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did. In Egypt, they put down their roots and they began to grow in numbers. They had finally found a home. As they no longer had to graze their animals in random regions of the country, Goshen on the east side of the Nile was one of the best spots. God, again, the best spots in all 
of Egypt. And so they prospered. Their, their, their livestock prospered. And it helped that the Egyptians, here's the thing that was interesting to me, that the Egyptians view people who raise animals as filthy. And so because they were shepherds and had animals, the Egyptians didn't want to have anything to do with them. And so they left them alone. They left them alone. Because of this view of life, the Egyptians left the Israelites alone. And because the Egyptians left them alone for long, for years, they multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. This began the habit of Israel keeping to itself and not mingling with other cultures. All those centuries by themselves made them into a very self-sufficient people. The Lord blessed them to grow despite their difficult circumstances. He never forgot them. This was all part of God's plan because great is his faithfulness. The whole time they were in Egypt, he was grooming them to fulfill his promises to their forefathers. He told them before Joseph of Egypt died that one day a deliverer would come and that his name would be Moses. Moses. They were looking forward to that day. And when Moses showed up declaring that it was time for their deliverance, the elders of Israel believed him because God had already forewarned and foretold them of what was to come. God's purpose for the world. We read in Romans 9 and 17, the following. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Wow. So in God's sovereign plan, he raised up this evil Pharaoh in order that his power might be displayed. And boy, was his power displayed when the Egyptians left excuse me, when the Israelites left Egypt. There was nobody but God. Nobody but God. And then the parting of the Red Sea and the plagues, God displaying his power, his majesty. Why did God allow the bondage to be so bad? Why did he allow Pharaoh to resist his own people with such stubbornness? Here is the answer. So that God may display his awesome power in delivering his people so that and so that all the nations who looked on would marvel and know that the God of Israel is the one true God. That's amazing to me. That's amazing. So, so it, it, and, and here's the key point for us. So here's the message for us today that our enemies sometimes are our greatest um, blessing because our enemies can take us to a, or deliver us to a place that God has already ordained. It's amazing. God is amazing. He really is amazing. In all the burdens and difficulties we go through in life, God has the same plan designed for those in the world around us. He cares for those who do not know him yet and would like his work in delivering us to be a testimony. Here it is. What is your testimony? What is my testimony? Does the world, when they hear me and see me, when they look at my life, do they see the workings of the mighty God? That's why we are not to respond like the world in many of our situations. And of course we are human, but we have a God that wants to use us to show the world that he's real. They need to see us sick and healed. Uh-oh. They need to see us in dire straits and delivered. They need to see us in situations where a normal person would be angry and curse. And, and they need to see us shut our mouths in peace. They need to see that. Then our witness is effective. Then I can say, when they ask me, how, why did you, how could you just keep your mouth closed like that when somebody's 
so hateful, say such hateful things to you. And then I can say, because of the power of God that rests in me, because it's my desire to represent the kingdom well, because every day I have to crucify this flesh. And if I didn't crucify it every day, I can, I can say things back to you. But I made up my mind a long time ago that I won't let that kind of thing take me back again. It took me too long to get to this place in Christ. It took me too long to allow God to strip all of that hatefulness, all of the meanness. I used to be so mean and I was saved. And I think back over the everything that God delivered me from, but he delivered me from myself and still is today. And I say to God all the time, I'll never go back to what I used to be. I used to, I couldn't understand. I was saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost or had the Holy Ghost. And I couldn't convince people that I was a loving person until hindsight when I look back and see how, how sharp my tongue was, how short my patience was, how judgmental I was how intolerant I was as a saint, because those were the things that God was trying to deliver me from, that he wanted to deliver me from. And so as I began to surrender who I was, who I thought I was, how I thought I should be, all and all of my greatness started to surrender it to God. My testimony began to become a, a real testimony that pointed to God, that he could get the glory out of. Because that's why we were created, to bring him glory, to bring honor to him. And so that people can say, I want that God that you serve. I want, I want him for myself. How can I get him? That's what we were created for. So delivering us to be a testimony that we would share with those around us so that they may know how wonderful the true God is. Our testimony is to our families. I think that is the I think that is the hardest vineyard to navigate through. Because when people are familiar with you, it breeds contempt. It does. They don't want to hear it. Um, so our testimony is to our family, but we have to continue to, to live right, to walk up right before our family members to make decisions that they may not always understand. Sometimes we are even led to do things that might seem harmful or look harmful. I had the hardest decision I had to, I ever had to make was when I had to put my niece out of my house. And I, I suffered for that because the Lord told me not to let her in. But I was trying to do the right thing, but not the God thing. See, there's a difference. There's a difference when God instructs you to do something and when you tell yourself, this is what I think I should be doing. And it caused a lot of resentment, a lot of hurt. But then God still worked it out in the end where he blessed her abundantly. And the Lord let me know, he said, had you obeyed me in the beginning, this would have happened much sooner. I learned my lesson. I learned my lesson in that. And so we, our testimonies to our family, our neighbors, co-workers, Everyone we meet to the world, our testimony is to the, to the world is we serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty God. Amen. And so we're at the final chapter 47 and talking about his Joseph's relationship with the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh that allowed his family to come into Egypt. How they got to be there because of this Pharaoh. Joseph's relationship with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, as shown here, is truly remarkable. If you think about the power that Joseph must have had, it is phenomenal that he would care at all about a Hebrew prisoner, even if he did help him out with the famine. But Pharaoh was not only, but Pharaoh not only spares Joseph, but it seems like he has a pretty close relationship with him. And in Genesis 41 and 38, it says, Pharaoh said, I don't think we could find anyone better than Joseph to take this job. God's spirit is in him, making him very wise. So even though Pharaoh was not a believer in the true God, he was correct in his assessment. 
the Holy Spirit was in Joseph. And it was the Holy Spirit that led Joseph in his dealings with his brothers when they came to Egypt to buy food. When we can look at the story and see, we can look at the story and see that with the plan of God, truly incredible things can happen during our lifetime. And they can, and they are happening daily. Everything that happened to Joseph was for a reason. The hatred of his brothers, being sold into slavery, imprisonment for a rape he did not commit. God used it all, the good, the bad, the ugly, to preserve the family line from which the Messiah would come. God is sovereign. No matter the decisions or actions of man, God's plan will always come to completion. Yes, man has free will. He can choose to obey God or he can choose to disobey, but God will always have his way. On this, Charles Spurgeon wrote, how wonderfully those two things meet in a practical, in practical harmony, the free will of man and the predestination of God. And here's the key point. When God is great in your life, even those who won't or don't serve him will recognize his sovereignty. When God is great in your life. If you ask Joseph when he was young, if he thought he would one day be standing as number two in common in all of Egypt, he might have just laughed. But here he was standing tall, making decisions and saving lives all in the name of of the Lord, or so it, it would seem. And Pharaoh, very much like Joseph, he liked him. He, he had an uh, affection for Joseph. When Pharaoh learned that his brothers had come, it pleased him, and he sent to bring back their families and give them the best land in Egypt. Then Joseph brings some of his brothers before the Pharaoh, and when they tell him that they are shepherds, Pharaoh says that they should settle in the land of Goshen, and if there are able men to even put them over his own, and then he gave them even able men to help them with their livestock. Pharaoh thought very highly of Joseph. This relationship would prove profitable and successful, as Joseph would eventually buy all the land and livestock for Pharaoh, so that whatever the people of the land would harvest, they would give one-fifth of their produce to Pharaoh. The famine would soon be over, but Pharaoh still had a lot he owed to Joseph and really to God more so than Joseph. Conclusion. Joseph looked at the world through God's eyes. That's important. And so he chose not to dwell on the things, the negative things that were happening in his life, but he kept looking onto the hills. He chose to look, see through God's eyes, he chose to give all his life over to the Lord. Joseph saw every situation in which he was placed as an opportunity to serve God, the God of Israel, his God. He did everything to the best of his ability, which God had given him. He always acknowledged that God was the source of his ability. That's important. It, we can't take credit for anything, really, because God is our source. It was God working through Joseph. It was God working through him. He could not take credit. He couldn't take credit for anything. Joseph used all the accomplishments for which man praised him to give credit back to God. All the glory goes back to God. Everything goes back to God. Give the credit back to the God of Israel, honoring and testifying to God's awesome power. It was God all the time and if you think back over your life it was God all the time and if it had not been God all the time we would not be here in this space and time in this moment we would not be here it was God all the time in sickness and in health in our losses and in our gains in our mourning and in our happiness it was God all the time it was God. Joseph's depth of emotion throughout these chapters tell us how deeply he had been harmed by his brothers, 
and the anguish he had felt over his separation from his brother Benjamin and from his father Jacob. And yet, Joseph never wavered in his love for and his trust in God. He never wavered. Never wavered. Here's your personal reflection from the study guide, the beginning of a people. Are there people in my life that I need to forgive so that I can be a blessing to them with a pure heart? And you should read Mark 11 and 25 with that. Are there people in my life that I need to forgive? so I can be a blessing to them with a pure heart. I remember asking God a little while back, why do I feel this way about this family member? Why, why God, why? You know, I'm doing stuff for them and stuff, but it's just something that I know that's not right in me. And the Lord let me know. And God will, is so personal. He will tell you exactly what the problem is if you want him to tell you. And he let me know that I was harboring anger towards this family member from things that happened over the years. And it just kind of built up in me. And so I tried to pretend like it wasn't there, but it was. And God in his mercy knew that I would come to him and come to the place where I would honestly ask him, God, what's wrong? What's wrong with me? Why, why can't I treat this person like they should be treated? Why do I speak to this person the way I speak to them? And God let me know. And I surrendered my heart to him because in everything, all my personal relationships, interpersonal relationships, I want it always to be and reflect, represent who I am in Christ Jesus. So our life application, the takeaway from this whole lesson, don't shout over it. Don't try to praise God over it. Don't dance over it. Don't teach over it. Please don't preach over it. But pray about it and get it right. Forgive. Final reflections. Draw nigh unto God. This is always the result that God desires out of any trial that we go through or burden we seek to be freed from. Exodus 2, 23 through 25 tells us that the Israelites cried out to God in their bondage and God heard their cry and took notice of them. And in that moment that they cried out was the appointed time for their deliverance to begin. Sometimes we, our timing is not God's timing. And sometimes we cry out and we wait and we wait and we cry and we cry and we wait. But there is an appointed time for everything. There's an appointed time for healing, complete healing. I know it. There's an appointed time for complete deliverance. There's an appointed time for, for families to be restored. There's an appointed time for those that we have been praying for for years and crying over for years. There's an appointed time for their deliverance and salvation. All we can do is stand back and be amazed at the wisdom and justice of Almighty God. His ways are perfect. While we live on this earth, we will never understand all that happens or why things occur in our lives. Like everybody's saying these days, life be life. And yes, we only see through a glass dimly, as the Bible puts it. But we can still rest assured that the invisible God is not only at work, but that he has a purpose in everything that he does. Remember that. Hold. Sometimes we have to hold on to the fact that there is a purpose, a rhyme and a reason, not according to our human mind and understanding, but according to the purpose or plan that God has for every one of our lives. And it may your life may not have turned out the way you have thought it should have or planned it, but it's, it's what God deemed for each and every one of us. And we have to find our place of contentment in that plan of God. Um, whether it is an unbeliever struggling under the bondage of sin or a believer going through a difficult trial, 
the result should be the same. And some trials of our, are of our own making, some are outside of our control, but none are outside the, of the range of a loving and sovereign God. I just want to leave you with this last scripture from Romans 11, 33 to 36. And it says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgment and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for listening to our Bible study this evening. We thank and praise God for the opportunity to come before his people again. Again, this is the Ephesus Ministries where our senior pastor, Jeff E. Carter Jr., our assistant pastor, Shannon L. Carter. I am your teacher for tonight, Elder Anita Dooley. And I just thank and praise God for this opportunity to break the word um, with the people of God. Be blessed, be blessed, be blessed. Elder Dooley, if I could just announce really quickly before you disconnect, um, thank you so much for a fantastic, phenomenal lesson. Type your message in the chat, go look at it. But um, thank you for a phenomenal lesson. Just wanted to let everybody know um, the books for the next module. The Kindle is available now on Amazon, <coughs> excuse me, within the next uh, 48 hours, I would say, approximately by the end of the week. Um, if you want to purchase through Amazon, the paperback should be available through Amazon. Um, it'll probably take a week or two before we have some in hand to purchase. But if you want to start preparing for our next module, I apologize. They were supposed to be ready already and I got behind schedule. But if you want to start preparing for the next module, the Kindle is already available on. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Pastor Shannon. Thank you. Looking forward to the next module. I'm, I'm, I am, uh, I, in case you can't tell, I am really enjoying this study. It has got me in the word. I've always been a studier of the word, but it's, I'm in deep now. <laughs> I'm in deep and I'm really loving it. So I thank and praise God again. And I bid you all good night. Wait, before you go, um, I forgot when you were asking for prayer for someone, um, I found out Elder Hennings mother passed away this past weekend so if we could pray for elder hennings and his family amen father god we just thank and praise you god uh, again we come before you with those who are mourning and in grief we ask that you touch the, the family of elder robert henning lord and the loss of his mother she he was blessed for 95 years with her god and you saw fit to take her home help them to receive your sovereign will we thank you and we praise you in jesus name thank god and amen yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Good night. Good night, all. Good night, Good night, Good night everybody. Love you all. Good night. Good night.